And then we'll just, we're just going to start this. Let's just start this right now. Um, <laughs> I love it. Oh my heavens. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, so should I just, just go? Is go for one? it, Dati. You should, are, you are, are everybody knows you. So I don't have to introduce you. So well, this you're is amazing. so cool. There's so many of you. This is, it just look at all these faces. And I, I actually love the way that you're doing the eyelash where we can see all the faces because so many webinars or, you know, series like this, it's just, it just, you know, you can't see anyone until the very end. And, and I don't know. Now I feel like I'm, I'm part of a, part of a crew already. So that's, uh, this is very cool. So I can't see anymore, y'all. This is just happening. And how fast is it going to progress? <laughs> um, all right. So I guess I'll share the screen, right? Is that what you want me to do? Uh, sure. So I can you... do so. Okay. All right. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Here we go. Have it. Not a lot of slides, but a few slides. Is that working? Absolutely. You see it. All right. So for special ed here, when I go forward on the slides, I can do my slides, right? I don't have to do, yes, yes, and it'll, it'll move, right? Oh, look at that. Okay, just checking. So what I'm going to do, y'all, is do, I, I've got three sections for you. I kind of split it up. Uh, the second session section is what Silesh asked me to do. But I have a first section uh, for you because I feel like uh, if if, I, if I'm going to be here with y'all and the focus of VCOP is uh, we're motivated, we're here, we're motivated to save the planet. So we have to talk about food, which y'all have been doing and will continue to do probably all day tomorrow. But you know from just eating plants yourself that anyone can thrive on plants, athletes or not. You can, I can the you know olympians that are going to stand on the podium in paris and everyone else in between so if we are to end animal ag the question for so many people is what will i eat and will i be strong and healthy eating only plants it's still a question for maybe some of us on this webinar right hopefully some people have 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 snuck in that are that that are that are not vegan and are, are just are just here to be inspired and learn but i know that Many of you are vegan already. So I want to use this first 10 minutes of my talk as fuel to share and discuss with your non-vegan friends, if that's okay. So I have something for you to consider. Think about this. It's not the strongest or the smartest who win, but those who can adapt. Dick Fosbury won a gold medal in 1968 with a very novel approach that probably some of you remember to high jumping called the Fosbury flop. He changed the game and all the other athletes in his sport had to adapt. In my sport of cycling, Greg LeMond won the Tour de France by eight seconds with never before seen aerodynamic handlebars, right? Like this, he changed the game and athletes had to adapt. And then when skin suits came out in the sport of cycling, they came out of the wind tunnel and showed us massive, massive gains in speed. They changed the game and athletes just like me, I remember this, had to adapt to being squeezed into them like an overstuffed burrito. I remember that adaptation and I never complained about my tight jeans again. Revolutionary gains are exciting, but they're rare. I have a good friend, Jeff Olson, who is a plant-based Olympic skier, and he talks about how evolutionary or incremental innovations are more the norm. Evolutionary advantage are earned daily over time, and they are the most prevalent on the road to winning. They're a function of continuous improvements and compounding progression. And really either way, whether it's revolution or evolution, when a clear athletic advantage becomes known, the best, the best athletes, they adapt. The best athletes in the world are ruthlessly practical and they will do what works in order to adapt in the least amount of time, right? We're always in a hurry. These athletes are moving to a mostly plant-based diet more and more because it physiologically works. The high-performance plant-based eating playbook aptly titled, Let the Plant-Based Games Begin, which there's the cover, um, we created it with 
uh, alongside the International Olympic Committee. It's called Let, Let the Plant-Based Games Begin, and you're going to receive it for free just for being here. So we'll have Silesh send this out. That's the link, but don't worry about it. I know he'll send it to all of y'all afterwards just for attending VCOP 16. But it's a deeper discovery into what works for athletes on plants. It's pretty geeky and it's filled with just over 200 references. So if you want to sit back and enjoy this section of this webinar, instead of taking notes, the book you will receive afterwards will have everything that I'm going to cover here and more. So the challenge that we have to consider with this book is to encourage athletes to think bigger and execute better. That's, that's what we do when we decide to make a shift as athletes, make a change in anything we're doing, whether it's a skin suit or aerodynamic handlebars or our diet. Why? Well, because athletes are people too, and they tend to follow social norms and animal foods have been normalized in our Western society forever. Now, I eat only plants daily now for their taste and the performance they give my body. But when I went plant-based back in 2010, no one was doing it. But as I transitioned, I started noticing really positive changes in my body in recovery and in output. And I had never known these feelings before when I was stuffing my face with animals. And I remember I started to ask more questions immediately, like, why? Why is the mammalian secretion from very specific bovine species sold to us as the perfect food for humans? And as I looked deeper, I realized the dairy industry is the title sponsor of the U.S. Olympic Committee. I was right. Always follow the daughter, dollar. They were selling a product and I wasn't going to be buying it anymore. And now after decades of working with athletes, here's what I know. Food is an actual weapon of the good kind. And plant foods are the most powerful weapons in the nutritional arsenal. Nutrient-dense plant foods condition physiological performance throughout functional, fit, and peak states. Peak physiology equals more physical capacity to achieve greater athletic results. Just think of it this way. Training is simply, and it really can just break down to this, Damage, repair, damage, repair, damage, repair. The more damage you can do, the more repair happens and the stronger, fitter, and faster you become. So what we use for repair <laughs> is critical. In other words, every single bite we take matters. And it's an exciting time for modern sports nutrition with a new era of high-performance nutrition underway. When we sought out to create this book, Let the Plant-Based Games Begin, it was really born out of a need because athletes from all over the world were contacting me and saying, I really want to try this plant-based thing. I'd like to adapt to eating plants. But their coaches were telling them, oh, no, no, it's not safe. <laughs> there isn't any evidence out there to prove that it works. That's just not true. There's loads and loads of evidence that plants will outperform eating animals every single time. So I'm going to pop into performance benefits of plants. And I'm just going to cover four and I'm going to cover them pr pr pretty briefly because you all know a fair amount of this. But there's some juicy stuff in here that I want to remind you of. All right. So we've got antioxidants, right? It's just critical. Inflammation and reducing it improving your energy and a healthy gut microbiome. So first of all, antioxidants. Many people are aware of free radicals, right? Mo molecules that damage our bodies on a cellular level and contribute to many chronic diseases. Fortunately, antioxidate, uh, antioxidants can eliminate these free radicals and bring about health benefits through this and also other pathways but the antioxidant content of foods varies by several thousand fold, which I did never really realize. But a comprehensive study of over 3,100 foods, beverages, spices, herbs, and supplements used worldwide found that on average, plant foods contain 64 times the antioxidant content of animal foods. That's mind blowing. This offers some insight into why plant-based diets protect us against so many chronic diseases and, as athletes, help us to recover so much faster than eating animals. All right, inflammation. Now, I got to tell you, when I was training really hard 
in a, in a really gnarly, tough training block. I wake up in the morning and I had a joke with my teammates because they felt the same way that we really couldn't go train till 10 because it took us from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. to start to feel like normal again, like we could move. I was so groggy when I woke up in the morning. I was like rickety and stiff. I felt like I was a hundred years old. I was bloated. And well, my husband might tell you I was a little cranky. It was literally an athlete hangover, right? It was it was so much damage uh, that I was feeling this way and I hadn't recovered yet. And an athlete hangover, well, it feels much like an alcohol hangover. Now let's think of it this way. Acute inflammation we know is normal. It's an important defense system, right? That our bodies use to keep us safe in the in the, you know, for infection or tissue damage, kind of like when you sprain your ankle. Normally it subsides though once the damaged tissue is cleared, but problems arise, and this is what was happening to me in the morning when I woke up, when inflammation becomes chronic, right? It doesn't have time to clear. Now mounting evidence tethers chronic inflammation to an array of health conditions that range from diabetes, heart disease, and cancer to rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and even asthma. Now importantly though, there's some hope, Dietary patterns strongly impact our inflammatory processes in our body and multiple, multiple lines of evidence. And I have all the references for this if you guys want it after. Multiple lines of evidence indicate that plant foods like fruits, veggies, and whole grains are linked to and exert actually anti-inflammatory and immunity regulating effects. Researchers agree that an Anti-inflammatory eating plan therefore focuses on eating whole plant-based foods that are rich in healthy fats and phytonutrients. Since such an approach is recommended by all international nutrition authorities, they may say some things about meat and dairy too, but they all recommend this style of diet, if you will, a wide spectrum of bioactive compounds and health-promoting concentrations. All right, we're going to move on to energy because I'd say pretty much all of us want more of it. And what gives us energy? What is it that we put in our mouth on a daily basis that gives us energy? Carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are king in the energy category. They are literally our body's source of energy, (gasps) not protein. (laughs) Muscles use carbohydrates as fuel right? They are literally an athlete's secret weapon. Plants are the only sources of carbohydrates and come with a hefty dose of antioxidants, yay for that, and also fiber. And carbohydrates found in plants are necessary right after exercise to get into the muscles and replenish energy before you start to load with protein for repair. Always, you want to get glycogen direct to the muscles, carbohydrates, right? Glycogen is carbohydrate. 45 minutes within a 45 minute window. And then after that window, you can start with some protein for repair. A plant-based diet also promotes better circulation, which helps oxygen to get to working muscles in need. And the nitrates naturally occurring in plants like beets, yes, 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 nitric oxide, please, lead to better oxygen efficiency, allowing athletes to do more work with less, less oxygen, which translates to all of us, whether we're just you know walking two or three miles in the morning or we're going to the Olympics. We can do more work with less oxygen when we eat these foods. Really, it's an athlete's, uh, an endurance athlete's dream. All right, and lastly, a healthy, healthy gut microbiome. There's over 3 trillion, but then a doctor told me the other day on our podcast, it's over 30 trillion. So somewhere in between of these little bugs that live in our gut and a healthy gut microbiome controls gut health by communicating with the intestinal cells, digesting certain foods and preventing disease causing bacteria from sticking to the intestinal walls. It's also, as many of us have heard, it's our second brain. And the research coming out in the last few years proves just how critical our microbiome is to peak performance in life, just regular life, like I'm living now, but also in sport for athletes. Plants promote a healthy microbiome through their fiber and polyphenol content. A healthy microbiome has been associated with leanness, cognitive benefits, improved circulation, enhanced nutrient absorption, and overall just feeling lighter with a much better digestion. 
Many animal foods like dairy products can lead to gut distress, we know, inevitably hampering performance, of course. And if I have learned anything from the multitude of doctors we've had on the Switch for Good podcast, it's that a healthy gut is critical to overall health and wellness, all the way from our mind down to our gut. All right. All right. So we're going to move on to section two. And it's titled, Why Dairy Will Be the First Animal Food to Fold and How Switch for Good is Winning. Now, this is the subject matter that Silesh asked me to cover when he invited me here to speak. And I said, Silesh, we're winning? He said, yes, you are. So I had to come up with all the reasons why to share with you fine people. So to go back a bit, the, the launch of Switch for Good almost six years ago was actually never intended to become an organization. What happened was that in 2018, a group of very passionate Olympians from four different countries, myself included, we banded together to film a 30-second commercial that would air on NBC on the closing ceremonies of the 2018 Winter Olympic Games. Much like you guys were talking about earlier, uh, something you know just, just hot and saucy that's going to gain attention and surprise people. We wanted to set the record straight, basically, and tell the world that cow's milk is not what fuels Olympic medals, as the dairy industry had been selling us athletes that lie for a very, very long time. And we'd had enough. So we gathered the evening the commercial was set to air. We gathered on Twitter back when Twitter was fun and awesome and cool. Um, it was in February of 2018, Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, and we're waiting for it to appear. appear. We had paid for it to air in six cities across the country. And I was in Los Angeles to watch this groundbreaking moment at 7.30, 35 p.m. We knew exactly when it was supposed to come on. And it never came on. The minutes ticked by, no commercial. I was totally devastated. We all were. And the next morning, we called NBC. And without saying it in so many words, they let us know that the dairy industry called and got our ad kicked off. Follow the dollar, right? It had actually aired once in Washington, D.C., and then the power of, the, of Big Dairy ruined us getting to expose their nasty truth. And I think if I've ever been grateful to any animal food industry, well, this was the moment I look back on, and I'm thankful that the dairy industry did this because that day is when I became a lifelong activist. I promised myself nothing like this was ever going to happen again. I would not be muzzled and unable to tell the truth. And we were going to fight all the way to the bitter end to put a stop to this horrid industry's chaos and wreckage of our planet, our health, and the precious beings who are enslaved and killed. Switch for, Gorn, Switch for Good was born that day. Uh, really, the, the title, we were putting the commercial out and we had like 48 more hours to get it to NBC. And we're like, crap, we need an end card. We have to tell people what to do. And we're telling them what not to do. And somebody said in the marketing, switch for good. And that's what was the end card of the commercial that never showed. So switch for, switch for good as an organization was really born that day though. Um, and we have spent every day since fighting for justice. Our work is quite expansive. We're here to end the consumption of dairy worldwide and Silesh says we're winning and he's the smartest people we all know. So person we all know, right? So here we go. But we know that this means corporations will need to modify their policy. We know that this means uh, human dietary shifts will have to happen and governmental change must occur. And it is. So let me take you through some of the reasons we are winning. Number one, dairy is the animal food group that makes the most people sick, uncomfortable, and in many cases, unable to breathe. 70% of the world is intolerant to even digesting lactose after infancy, which is a completely normal situation. Humans are born with an enzyme lactase, which helps us to digest lactose, but in most humans, that enzyme is designed to turn off post breastfeeding years. The symptoms people experience when drinking and eating dairy products span from upset stomach to bloating to gas, diarrhea, runny nose, congestion, difficulty breathing, and even skin rashes like eczema and psoriasis. Sounds like a pharmaceutical ad. Beware. In fact, my good friend, and some know her, uh, gastroenterologist, Dr. Angie Sedeghi, she says that people come to her all the time with these symptoms and they beg for a solution. 
She says, all right, quit dairy for 14 days and come back to see me. And she says more than 75% of these folks come back and tell her she has changed their life. It was just the dairy makes people feel like crap. This is why we believe dairy is the best entry point for folks who want to start removing animal foods because people feel so much better in such a short period of time when they ditch dairy. It almost becomes like this addiction to feeling better. They want more. They want to know what the next steps are. In the first few months of Switch for Good, we created this um, online lactose intolerance test. There wasn't anything like it that was existed on the internet. We thought, gosh, people have to at least have a way to know if, if they have it and that, that's, that it's the dairy. Over 10,000 people a week were taking it in the beginning because nothing else was out there. People were just desperate, right? They didn't know where to go and they wanted to find out why they felt so crappy after consuming dairy. And when we take people on a dairy-free journey, they become, it's, it's like they just light up. They become so excited about the possibilities of how good they can feel. So try it with your friends. You will be amazed at the reaction. All right, here's another reason. The plant-based milk market is nearing 19% of the total market, total milk market. People love plant milk. We all knows this, know this. It's delicious. It's nutritious. And people can see and feel the difference, well, immediately. According to Hordes Dairy Man and National Dairy Farm Magazine, the fluid milk movement is at an all-time low in the U.S. Kind of after pinging around in the 30% level from 2005 to 2017, fluid milk's usage of all federal order milk fell to 28% in 2018, reports the publication. And then it rebounded momentarily during the pandemic in 2020 and 2021 to go over 30%. Then that metric plummeted again to 26% last year, a 75-year low. And in June 2022, the USDA commented that the decline in fluid milk consumption was likely due to a change in dietary habits as individuals are drinking less milk. And according to dairyherd.com, dairy farms are also frequently closing up shop. Earlier this year, it was revealed that in Wisconsin, where dairy is obviously a major industry, around 10,000 dairy farms have been lost in the last two decades. And in the last year alone, the state lost 455 dairy farms across the U.S. as a whole. And currently now in the United States, there are less than 30,000 dairy farms in business. And here is where I think the truth is really shocking, but hopeful. 73% of the dairy industry's income in the United States comes from our federal government. The public is not keeping the dairy industry in business. Sadly, our tax dollars are. This is both frustrating yet filled with hope because when the government finally wakes up to the extraordinary amount of waste they are supporting in our school system alone, the tide will continue to shift. In 2019, USDA, USDA reports showed that 29% of the milk cartons placed on children's trays in schools are thrown away to, into the garbage unopened. They're not even opening it. This equates to 300 million of yours and my tax dollars being lit on fire every single year. It's about a billion dollars, the, the school lunch program a year. So 30%. It's 300 million bucks, and it will equal $5 million of your money over the next 10 years if they keep it up. We are literally teetering on the edge of winning. And with our federal bill known as the ADSOY Act, which some of you have been uh, so incredible in supporting, and our, also our work on the dietary guidelines, we are closer to the finish line, I think, than we ever were. Our ADSOY Act is a bipartisan bill and has been introduced in both House and Senate it's very simple, Bill, actually. It will require public schools to offer soy milk to kids in the National School Lunch Program. Crucially, the bill also directs the USDA to fully reimburse schools, right? Because that's the main problem. They're not reimbursed for the cost of the plant milk provided at the same rate as dairy milk. And this alleviates the financial burden, right? School districts are already facing as they struggle to provide healthy, nutritious meals for all students. Okay, so 
I think I would be remiss if I didn't touch on dairy's contribution to killing our precious plant, precious planet, given the focus, obviously, of VCOP and why we're here. So I chose some kind of easy to remember, somewhat shocking statistics that will entice your friends and family to maybe make a change. This one's kind of my favorite line because it's just packed so much punch. By ditching dairy and choosing a planet-friendly plant milk instead, you will reduce your carbon emissions by 45%, your land use by 55%, and your water use by 107 whopping percent. A dairy farm with just 2,500 cows produces 110 million pounds of waste per year, equivalent to the waste from a city of 411,000 people, which is about the size of Sacramento, California. And butter. Butter ranks third on the National Resource Defense Council's chart of 10 com common climate damaging foods. It requires 21 gallons of milk to make one, just one pound of butter. And 1,000 gallons of water is what is required to produce just one, just one gallon of cow's milk. So do we have any hope? We do. We do. We're winning, says Silesh. Is there hope? There is. There definitely is. I often say that this fight to end the consumption of dairy and other animal foods is, is my second Olympics, but this is the one that really matters. My first Olympics were quite self-serving. Yes, it was a magical moment in time, and I have great memories because, like childbirth, I've forgotten most of the bad memories. <laughs> there are plenty. But this Olympics... This one, where I fight till the end, is the one that will hopefully leave this world for the better. When COP28 was underway and the meat and dairy industries were out, they were out in full force, right, to lobby policymakers, I was receiving a lot of emails. I'm sure you all were too, some of which were for interviews on how I felt about this fact that meat and dairy are at this conference. And I just had a different view of it than most. I said, my first reaction, remember the first phone call, I said, it's about time they show up to fight. This is literally what we have been asking for. I see the, the fight by big ag, big meat and dairy, big egg as positive in the sense that they see the need to fight us. Because for as long as we can remember, they have totally ignored us for a very long time. Then they certainly spent time laughing at us but now they are clearly threatened by our momentum and afraid of losing their grip. This generation, like we were talking about earlier, they, they won't put up with their lies, right? This generation asks hard questions and they don't just believe in marketing just because somebody says, yeah, milk does the body good or got milk. This generation says, uh-uh, no, prove it to me. And while on the surface, it feels like our movement is being attacked. So I understood the questions, right? That's what it felt like. Underneath it all, I... I see hope because the fact that meat and dairy are shaking in their boots, worried that their stronghold will loosen or they would not have shown up is exactly what we have all been hoping for for a very long time. And they're not going to go down without a fight. There's just, there's way too much at stake, right? Way too much at stake. The fight is what we have been asking for. So let's not act so surprised and worried that the fight's upon us. Because now is the time that we we get to rise to the occasion and, I guess, continue to fight like our lives depend on it because in a way they do. I have a short story for you to end on. So if all of you all will do me a favor and just kind of relax in your chair and close your eyes for a moment and allow me to tell it to you. I'd like to ask you to think back to a time when you were fighting for something, even though all the odds were stacked against you. A time when people told you, eh, you can't, no way, it can't be done. It's just not realistic. Maybe that time is now. Maybe it's your, your fight to save the planet. Maybe it's your fight to save the animals. Maybe it's something else. But let me ask you this. What is it that keeps you in your fight? Think about that. This question takes me back to 2001 
which feels like eons ago, doesn't it? My cycling career was just taking off and I was starting to get noticed. And in just three years of cycling at the ripe old age of 28, I had just placed fourth at the U.S. Nationals in the road race. And that got me noticed by the national team, which got me invited to a training camp at the Olympic Training Center where there was lots of milk in Chula Vista, California. I arrive at camp with this kind of like go rogue or go home attitude. I had nothing to lose. I was going to give it all I had. And our first morning, we were all called to the lab for physical testing. It's here where they strap a mask to my face that measures oxygen consumption known as a VO2 max. I had to leave my fingers. They were dangling below the handlebars that I had a complete death grip on because they would prick them for blood every 30 seconds to measure my lactate threshold. And I was on a stationary bike, looked a little bit more like a torture chamber as it had wakes, weights stacked behind it, tethered to a rope using a pulley system. And I had to pedal as hard as I could to hold those weights in suspension for as long as I could until the weights literally became cra came crashing to the ground because I could no longer pedal. It's a lot. So once I'm all geared up, the mask on and tubes running in and out of my body, it's go time. And the sports scientists enter the room for testing and I take off and I'm just going for it. I am pumping at top speed despite the bulky mass that I can't breathe through. The constant prick of tiny needles doesn't even prevent me from taking hold. And I'm just powering through with everything I have. And I keep going, making sure that when this suffering ends, I can say I had nothing left to give. And adrenaline and a total lack of oxygen make my heart race faster than my legs can pedal. And every muscle starts to scream, stop. But I keep pushing. I keep fighting all the way to the end. And then it ends. The weights come crashing to the ground. And the men say, stop. I don't know why they were all men, but they were. It was 2001. There are three men, each juggling coffee and a clipboard, a clipboard deciding women's fate with their 30-minute assessments. One of the men reminded me of Kermit the Frog. Now, not to put down Kermit, but he did have a eerily similar voice. And with his uncapped silver pin, he motions for the other men to look at the printout from my test he's holding. And his big Kermit eyes, they just kind of start darting around the room. It was almost as if I was already forgotten. He was looking at the other women who were also being tested that some of them already Olympians and world champions. He taps the pin on his clipboard and he says, nice effort, Dotsie. And with that, he shows me the reading from his magic test. And I see potential rankings on a graph, right? They kind of have it this way. It's like amateur, professional, national caliber, world-class, and I think Olympic potential at the top. And in the middle of it is a tiny black circle that represents the diagnosis of my natural talent and ability. And he reinforces where my little dot lies by tapping it with his pen. Average. That's what I had achieved. A status of mediocrity. According to this graph, I was slightly better than average level, but I showed no hope for world-class competition and certainly not the Olympics. I try to look into Kermit's eyes, right, to thank him for his time, but he just kept darting. So I just say, got it. And I walk out of the lab. And as I drive home on the 405, I wonder if there was some sense of power or pleasure in telling young women that their Olympic dreams stop here. I chuckle to myself and smile because honestly, I'd never dreamed of the Olympics. I've just fallen in love with the sport and with the discovery of what my body can achieve. I physically shake my head as I drive. <laughs> Less than five years ago as a 98 pound anorexic with a ferocious cocaine addiction. This body was once so sick that I saw no way out but death because I couldn't figure out any other way to make the suffering stop. And before recovery, every hour that I was awake, I was suffering. And now the same body's strong enough to race against lifelong athletes. So Kermit, I think to myself, it's all good. I'm going to stay in love with cycling. I'm so curious to see what's possible. And that fuels me. I love discovering what the human body and mind are capable of. And no matter how much it hurts, I can trust that this is temporary because you can find better talent than mine. You can find stronger, more experienced, and much younger women than me. But I know this. No one can outsuffer me. And I wonder how many women and girls before me have left that lab and decided to quit. Average. I think about quitting. Oh, yeah, I do. But I can't. And I know it seems crazy, and I know it seems impossible. But 
And I know too, I have to keep fighting because I just can't not fight. How many of us have imagined quitting? Whether it's our activism, when we feel defeated, or something specific in our own lives that's going on. We are up against a giant, the animal agriculture industry with billions and billions of dollar and a mighty force of humans, right, who are very committed, who went to COP28 to going to the final round with us, us. Now, we at Switch for Good exist to eliminate dairy consumption on this planet. <laughs> when we let our analytical brain dissect, uh, dissect that mission, right, my God, it feels impossible, it feels silly. But when the odds feel that overwhelming, when the goal seems impossible, or when the work feels tedious and endless like it does, it's my hope that you will remember the power that you have within every single one of you and the reasons, the reasons you care so deeply and you won't ever stop fighting. Because we know that the alternative is to live forever with the taste of quitting on our tongue, case of quitting on our planet, quitting on those animals. We know that we, we just can't live with that. But as it turns out, you know who can live with that? Kermit. Remember when I walked out of the lab and be damned that diagnosis of average? Well, I later learned that Kermit too was once diagnosed as average. It was in that very lab in Chula Vista some 15 years before where he gave up. He let the odds determine his fate and his conquests are now in the hands of warriors warriors like us. And so it's not coincidental that when I stepped down from the podium at the Olympics, there was Kermit. Yep. He went all 20 years with me. Kermit was one of the first people there to congratulate me. And he reached out to hug me. And he's, as he did, he says into my ear whispers, I don't know who's more proud, you or me. I stepped back, determined to look into those always darting eyes. And I said, <clears throat> me. <laughs> That's right. There are those who listen only to logic and give streak to their fear, thereby putting their fate in the hands of other people, other people like us, because that's who we are. That's who you are looking at every one of your faces right now. We are the people who simply can't not fight. We are the warriors. We are the ones who are on the right side of history, and we won't ever give up. It's an honor to be with y'all tonight. Hopefully, I gave you a little more fire to step in the ring tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. So thank you. And thank you, Silesh, for putting this together. It's extraordinary. You certainly did. That was awesome, Dotsie. Thank you so much. You are welcome. And there you are at our Starbucks <laughs> protest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. Thanks for showing up. Yeah, always, yeah. anytime. Good. Well, I'm so here to continue the chat or answer any questions, or you could just slide on to the next person if you want, whatever you choose. <laughs> oh, no. We have about... Uh, 13 minutes for questions. So let okay. me stop the sharing. Uh, we have watch first. Oh, I can take these off now. I don't have to yeah. read words anymore. <laughs> watch, go ahead. Oh, there we go. Oh, mm. thanks, Dotsi. Uh, thanks, Dr. Rao. Dotsi, great presentation, very inspiring. Uh, my question is around uh, $20 billion of our tax money goes to subsidizing the dairy industry, and that's what's keeping it propped up. So, you know, yes. Right. That's the school lunch program, $20 billion over, $10 billion over the next 20 years, and about $300 million just in the dairy alone that's thrown away every year because it's about a billion dollars a year. Right, right. And we were talking earlier that the habits form in our early childhood development and people mm -hmm. who are addicted to dairy, including myself, it takes a while to wean us off. And in spite of all the asthma, allergy, 
acne and the ill effects on the respiratory system so my question yeah. is you know, we, the system is designed to, to for us is stacked up against us you know we yeah. we we have 60 people on this call uh, you know mm-hmm. i'm grateful for that that but with the government the the system is stacked up and also the dairy industry is buying up all these plant based meat analogs and plant based dairy analogs yeah. so yeah. it's like if if i'm buying a plant based milk i'm also supporting the dairy industry you know the i'm also supporting the capitalism and there's so few of us and so many of them so how do we how do we operationalize our our strategy to make sure that we are on the path to victory and not a path to burnout oh it's almost like two questions in one you know i i think about it all the time why there's still so many people consuming our friends and it's it 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 really just comes down to there are a lot more people on this planet that want to do what's normal they mm-hmm instead of what's different. I mean, that's what we are here, right? We're just, we're on mm-hmm. the fringe. We're different. We're punching through barriers. We're wanting to make change. And, but the the general public, they just, they want to feel, I guess, safe. They want to feel right. like they're doing what others are doing. They want to just, it's almost like it's, it's vanilla to me, but that's me being judgmental. You know, they just want to be the exact same. They want to get in, in the row. They want to get in line and they want to do, it's like just robotic almost. And so how we change that system and, and a belief system that it's good and better to be just like normal, like, like everyone else and like your neighbors, people don't want to stand out. I get asked that a question all the time. And I know you guys do constantly, um, I just feel so weird at a restaurant ordering the food. That was happening a lot, like about a year after Game Changers came out when everybody shifted and then I, it, the conversation started shifting and it was, um, oh yeah, the Game Changers. I, I saw that. It was great. Oh, cool. Did you change your diet? Oh, totally. And I lost like 50 th- pounds. I felt amazing. Oh, how's it going now? Uh, I went back. What What happened? Number one answer. There's some different answers. Number one answer I got. It was just so weird socially. Like I just got tired of being that person in the restaurant Mm -hmm. that was asking for the weird food or whatever. And I thought, oh my God, there's the difference. Because how do all all of us feel? We're like, hey, Mr. Winger, (laughs) what's up? Like, I'm going to have this, this, and this on the menu. Can you ask the chef to me? And I'm like really loud about it. And I act really happy about it. I don't whisper. I'm not, you know, and thank you so much. And then I want people to see. I've never had a waiter be a jerk. They're always like, either let me check with the chef or, hey, no, I think we can do that for you. You got it. Uh, I, I, I don't know what to do about the 96% of the people that just seem to really want to follow the crowd. And I think that could also be a subject matter in our brainstorming session on the ads because some of it's going to come down to advertising, right? Like that's mm-hmm. how tobacco was, it became unpopular. You can't watch a movie from the 40s or 50s or 60s where everybody in the scene isn't smoking. <laughs> but now, right. not not so cool. Right. right. Thanks. That wasn't an answer because I don't have the answer, but I do I do think that we're all inching there and I think if we, you know, collectively it we're we're going to have to make this more normal. Yeah. I mean, period end of story. How we do that, that's 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 a big question. Yeah. I mean, I think your ad soy act is part of that normalization that you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, it is, and so is the the the, the Starbucks dropping the plant milk upcharge. You know, I mean, right. that can look kind of like just you know from the outset, like oh, what's the big deal? It's all about the normalization of plant foods. So it's not this weird upcharge, this eighty cents for these weird milks that nobody knows. No, if it's just there and it's an option, it's nor becomes normal. It becomes normal to try a, to take a plant milk at school, just like it used to be normal to take a cow's milk. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Jane. Gatsy, I love your presentation. And have you ever thought of running for political office? And I don't mean this in any really political way, but you're in Orange County. It's a Republican uh, area. 
they supposedly want to cut wasteful spending and you make a very good argument as opposed to coming at it from an animal rights perspective, just come at it as a waste perspective. White Coat Waste has been mm -hmm. very successful mm -hmm. collaborating with Republicans on the fact that a lot of these laboratory experiments are just obscene waste. Mm -hmm. Uh, have you thought about? I think you'd be an incredible candidate, maybe even running as a Republican. <laughs> That's not going to happen, Jane. Um, <laughs> the, you know, it's interesting that you mention it because I've been bugged by some folks because it's, you know, how well, everything is about timing, but so is a political race. And I'm in um, Katie Porter's district and she's abandoned the seat and running for Senate. So th this is the time, but the primary is in like six weeks. Um, so I, I, you know, this, this really, anyway, no, yes. And no, y yes, I have. And I think it could be in the future, but in, in, in my district right now, I've, I've, I've kind of missed the, missed the window, missed the race. So we'll have to hope that whoever gets in there is wildly unpopular and does a terrible job. And then I can run maybe. Yeah. I <laughs> That's nice of you. Great. I think you would be great. I think you have all the characteristics that would make you a great candidate. Thanks, Jane. That means a lot. Absolutely. I agree. Liz, did you have a question? Hey, my two favorite ladies here, Jane Velez Mitchell and Dotsie Bosch, you two bring me so much joy being able Aww. to see your work. And I have to tell you, the USDA work that you're doing is the going to be the only way to really open the door because that's the pushback I always get working in our schools. Yeah. It's part of the USDA regulations. Yeah. So therefore, we don't have to do anything about it. It's right. okay for us to continue doing what we're doing. And it's a real shame. I've shared my story about the garden project in my school where I tried to get plant-based milks or plant-based. The curriculum contains dairy. And we're not allowed to talk about it. You can talk about how fruits and veggies are grown all day long, but if you say one negative thing about that tub of Greek yogurt on the table, or even want to mention the production, the environmental impacts, um, anything about it, it's absolutely yeah. forbidden and it makes them uncomfortable. I made them uncomfortable by questioning dairy. And do you know what? People were uncomfortable when we wanted to overcome slavery. People were uncomfortable when we wanted to fight for women's rights. People were uncomfortable when we fought for civil rights. And here we are again. People yeah. are uncomfortable. Yeah. And um, I, I just salute you. And Jane, I'm going to contact you about your TikTok program too. I want to help you ladies as much as I can. And That's we all awesome. need to, we need to sign the petitions. We need to yeah. support you and have mm -hmm. our voices heard. So please tell your family and friends to support these initiatives when we see them, because that's the key to success. The USDA dietary guidelines need to change. And you won't believe this. My mother and her family were a USDA family of the year in the 1940s. On, the, on their magazine, there's a picture of my mom and my grandmother carrying their groceries and they came in to film the family. This was the all-American family. They lived outside of Washington, D.C. If they only knew my mother was going to have a vegan daughter someday, right? Right. Oh <laughs> USDA my God. Family of the year. That's so insane. here we are. And oh, I Liz. know, yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna happen. It's, it's happening. Thank you. Yeah. It's happening. Yeah, it, it is. We're in the midst of it. I, I try to remind myself of, of this fact every day because it, 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 to all of us, it seems like it's taking forever, but the national school lunch program was formed in 1946, right? It's 2024. It's been 78 years where the children have had one choice for a beverage. So it's going to take a hot minute to unwind and unravel and be able to figure out. The USDA asked me on a conference call a year ago, well, how much is the soy milk going to cost? Like I'm making the soy milk. I'm like that's it. that's literally your job and you should know. And well, I'm pretty sure last time I checked, soy milk is soybeans and water and you just squeeze the soybean. And then I, didn't I went through how they, <laughs> the cows eat the soybeans and then come out with cow's milk. But they are just, they don't know what to do because nobody's ever asked any questions <sighs> that dairy milk's not okay, right? 78 years of it. We've even had some 
plant, not like in our movement, but some plant forward organizations say, no, they can't support the bill because in reality, they'll say it's going to be too complicated to implement. Yeah, it's going to be complicated. We've done one thing for 78 years, but we're going to have to figure this out. Yeah. Right. So it's, yeah. it's, it's tough when something well, is, well, is so long standing. I, I asked my grandson's school, why isn't the soy milk available? I really didn't believe that they actually had any in stock. I said, please show it to me because I really don't believe you even have it. Um, but the school food service director, they did. They opened the refrigerator and in there was some little boxes of soy mm. milk. And one of the kids mm. said, hey, I want to see that soy milk. And guess what the gal at the lunch counter said? No, you can't see it. You're not lactose intolerant. I asked the school food service director, um, "What? Mm. how come it's not available? She said, well, Hollandia Dairy delivers the milk to us and they charge four times as much for the oat milk than they do the cow's milk. See, the dairy mm -hmm. industry is distributing the soy milk and jacking up the price four times to these schools. So they keep it hidden. They really don't want you to know because it just costs too much. So thank you. We are going to win mm -hmm. at this. It's yeah. so... Yeah. Let's use critical thinking. Come on, grow the soy, feed the cows, make the milk. How about grow, grow the soy, feed the people, right. make it organic. We can do this. We're going to do this. I'm there to support you. And you too, Jane. Much love to you ladies. Thank you. Liz needs to run for office too. I'm just going to yeah. say that. <laughs> no way. Come on now. <laughs> Looks like loads of fun, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Mm. Well, thank you so much, Dotsy. That was an amazing presentation, a perfect ending for the first day. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, you you hit it out of the park for me. And everybody's all revved up now from the first day, right? Like nobody wants yes, to go to bed. Absolutely. You should just go all night. Just keep it all night. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jane.